Welcome to the Swine Time Podcast here at Pipestone. I'm your host, Dr. Spencer Wayne. I am one of the staff veterinarians, one of the owners uh, at Pipestone Holdings, and I'm the host of this podcast, and it's an opportunity for me to bring interesting people to talk about interesting topics uh, within our world, with our little piece of the world here in pig production. Today, I've got a special guest. He's my first lawn care person that I've ever worked with. Uh, he mowed my lawn diligently throughout all the summers of 2009, 2010, I think 2011, somewhere in there. So welcome Hayden Kirkhart, who, oh, Hayden is also one of our nutritionists here at Pipestone. That's probably a second point I should add. And he's gonna to talk to us about getting back to the basics with regard to nutrition. Hayden, I'll quit talking, introduce yourself a little bit. Who are you? Hey Spencer, thanks for that introduction. Uh, it's probably the nicest introduction you've ever given me. Usually you just hammers down on that lawn care deal, but uh, probably the best lawn and pipe zone at that time. So uh, I can't really argue with that one, but I will say Spencer did pay good. But uh, no, today my role would be as a nutritionist with the company, really focused in wean to finish uh, operations there. And it's, uh, it's been pretty fun. I've been here for about two years now. Um, but it, it's one of those things where you can say you're kind of a Pipestone born and raised kid and you come back to the operation and um, that's, that's where I met Spencer was in Pipestone. So it's, it's pretty cool to come back to the company that is a part of your community where you were raised in. And glad yeah. to be here, Spencer. So you were educated at SDSU first. Right? Yep. Animal Science Program, Prop, I'm Guessing, Animal yep. Insight Program. Then you went to grad school down at K-State. You bet. So uh, South Dakota State, go Jacks. Uh, Got to go win the Summit League this year. Got to throw that shout out. And then uh, Kansas State down at the Swine Nutrition Program where uh, it, it's an incredible, talented group of professors down there. So pretty thankful to learn with them. Yeah, kind of a machine that keeps chugging away every year at K-State. All right, and then back to Pipestone. And then back to Pipestone. Well, actually Baltic. Uh, I live in Baltic, South Dakota there with my wife and uh, our dog and hopefully sooner little baby girl. So. Okay, yeah. Wait, uh, about a month? About a month, about a month. So life is gonna go up uh, side down for me and it's gonna be a learning experience. Uh, my wife did not like the joke about hanging a heat lamp or a brooder with a couple mats in the nursery. Uh, but uh, you know, I figured that's how we get these little pigs started. I know, I had similar thoughts that we would just build a stainless steel floored nursery, like coat everything in stainless so you could pressure wash it down easily at the end of the day. But my wife didn't go for that either. And if you have a pit, you don't have to change diapers, right? No, exactly. Just, just a good wash job. Um, all right, enough of that. Today, starting pigs right. Uh, or back to the basics. Uh, let's start with just starting pigs right. You, you know, I've seen you with, with clients, with your clients, and, and oftentimes my clients talk about the importance of getting the nursery diet right. But then there's a lot of management things as well. And you focus, I think, really well on really good nursery diets for starting. But we'll get into that in a second. What are the key things as far as non-nutritional items that you got to have in place before the nutrition can be good? Yeah, I think one of the big things uh, is the, the three big ones, right? A pig can live three minutes without air, three days without water, and three weeks without uh, feed. Granted, not three <laughs> weeks, but it's the three, three, three. Yeah. If, you, if you don't have water, nothing's going to live. Then you got to go in there, is it, how's the air feel? Am I getting enough air movement? I think a lot of guys forget about air and ventilation. They like it hot, they like it stuffy. Spencer, what likes to grow in hot and stuffy environments? Lots of bad bacteria also do, so that's, yeah, exactly. And so the, you know, to the water, well, the air, what you just said, and then the water thing, it seemed like huge impacts of a guy that put the same pig in one nursery versus the other, but the one nursery, they got little red bulls. Uh, they, they're chored multiple times in that first few days where they're inspired to get up and drink out of the little red bulls, mostly for hydration, sometimes gruel, but just get the intake, get the intake. And then the guy says, well, they got feed in the feed pan, they're not eating. It's like, well, hold on. Or they got water in the cup, they're not drinking. If you put it in a bowl, just the behavior drives all the intake. It's, mm -hmm. it's pretty incredible. So you can have the best or worst nutrition, but if you don't inspire the pigs to get up and consume that in the first few days, uh, even the best pigs won't be as good as it could have been. So mm -hmm. it's a huge deal that first few days. They count way more than all the rest of the days in the nursery combined is if you can get them started right. Yeah, it's. Uh, I agree with you. And going back to the behavior, you know, kind of a little bit to what you said, uh, mac feeding is a huge one to getting those pigs up. Two reasons. You're in the pen, you give them activity, uh, a lot of those times those little buggers don't even want to get up when you walk into the barn. Now if you're in the pen, you got the stimulation, I'm up, oh hey, I'm actually hungry, or oh hey, I'm thirsty, so I'm going to go find that water, I'm going to go find that feeder, 
But then when you're mat feeding, uh, I think one of the, you know, you can throw your feet wherever you want, but pigs are incredibly social. Uh, you'll see it with nipple bars. They just line up, they like to go head to head. A, it looks like a sow's underlying and they're gonna go head to head, but they're also socializing their mat feed like that. Line that mat up like a cattle feed bunk and make your feed in a line. Mm -hmm. And it's incredible how those pigs go head to head and they just look at each other, they're eating, they're socializing. I think you get a lot more stimulation with those pigs and it's, uh, uh, pigs are huge social animals, mm -hmm. so. No, I 100%, uh, probably keep talking about this for everybody, it is super important like the first few days of just getting that behavior because they just came off a saddle where they all went up in a group and drank together and all of a sudden you're putting them in an environment where oh now you're going to all take nice turns no they're going to they want to get up and do it as a social group as well and if you get them through the first few days they take care of themselves largely after that but get their guts going and if the gut sits empty for some period of time uh my experience and just the observation would be that uh, diarrhea starts to set and they get they get enteric problems if they're not having steady intake in the first few days so get the water in get the feed in and the air is in there in the background yeah. Um, full value pigs. Oh, the common complaint in the nursery would be, man, the pigs in general look good, but man, I got these fallouts. These fall mm -hmm. The complaint about fallouts, and then you spend a lot of time working on where did it come from? Is it, oh, it's the salient that some of these bum pigs, they don't start, well, maybe there's some issues there. But uh, how do you address the, the situation of I got fallout pigs? You know, if you go into a barn and you see fallout pigs occurring, usually after day seven is the rule of thumb when you can start saying it's probably either an environment or it's a nutrition issue. Now, if you can go in there and you can say, oh, my environment's great, it's not hot, or it's not overly hot, and it's not humid, or I'm not drafting and cooling these pigs, but it's, it's beautiful, these pigs lay out great, but I'm still seeing fallbacks, I'd say it generally tends to go back to the nutrition platform at that point. Uh, and really, it's probably either because they're not eating or we're burning their stomachs out or it's just not an optimal diet. And that can be a wide grade term that you say, right? But I would say in my experience is the diets that seem to have more fallouts tend to be the more inexpensive diets. So so you mentioned two things that I would, you know, one is they're not, well, I'll get to the mysterious one to be first. What do you mean by burn their stomachs out? Mm -hmm. Burn their stomachs out. Essentially, either A, they're not eating, so you're letting a bug load go and they're just scouring, or, or they're eating something that's way too hot of a diet, or generally, when I say too hot, either too high in crude protein is a general term, not the pure scientific term, or it's usually too hot in bean meal. A lot of people don't understand bean meal makes your nursery diets look really cheap because it's cheaper than using your or your alternative products such as whey, sugars, plasma, other animal proteins that generally have these pigs starving incredibly well, but it makes your diets more expensive. Mm -hmm. And so that bean meal helps reduce that cost. But at the same time, these little pigs switching from milk to a corn soy diet, boy, that, that bean meal, they're allergic to it. There's that enzyme called trypsin, causes inflammation in that stomach and then that uh, in their GI tract essentially. And that's what really causes that looseness early on generally. And uh, when I say you're burning out their stomachs, it's because they're they're going through a screen door uh, and it, it's not good. Okay, so yeah, basically their GI tract is, is it's on high speed with because of an allergic reaction essentially or inappropriate protein profile or something. It's, it's something yeah, wrong. yeah. Okay, so it looks, it looks like a college kid that went and ate Taco Bell at <laughs> 2 a.m. and then the next morning they wake up. So, oh, all right, <laughs> good, good, uh, good analogy there. So uh, the other thing you mentioned was not eating. So first thing is, oh, I got diarrhea. It's just going through them. It's not effective nutrition. Second thing is, oh, they're not eating, which I would say, yeah, that's, that's the common complaint or they're both common, but it's, oh, the pigs come in and they're not going through their diet. There you know, must be something wrong with the pig. Sometimes there is, sometimes there's flu or something going on that's causing them to be lethargic. But how easy can the diet impact that? We're like, these pigs don't like this feed. They're just not eating. Is, mm -hmm. that, is that a chunk of it that's diet related or management related or how would you frame that up? I would say it can be tiered both ways, right? If you left your feed in the feeder for a week prior to those pigs coming in and now we have a stale feed, it's just like if you were to go sit your chips out for a week and you try and come back and eat them. They're stale, they don't taste as good. That can happen to these nursery diets because we have a lot of whey and again, sugar in there, regardless of the platform it's in there. And now all of a sudden it's gonna be stale, it doesn't taste as good. And the other one, if it is diet related, you go and eat it and you get an upset stomach, you're sure as heck not gonna wanna go back and eat it again. Yeah, yeah so I'm just thinking, okay, what would you not do? 
probably wouldn't buy like six months worth of starter pellets or something mm -hmm. and have them sit there through the summer or whatever it is yep. that get stale in a paper bag. Um, okay, I always wonder why my chips tasted bad <laughs> a week later, but now I know. Um, you know, kind of related to all that is you, you turn this nursery every six and a half, eight weeks, whatever it's going to be, nine weeks, mm -hmm. some turn on a nursery. And at the end, you got this nursery three diet or whatever is in the bin, and it's, it's half up the cone. And uh, like the answers are not uh, complex, they're just hard to do sometimes. And, and it's like, oh, the hassle of emptying out the bottom of the bin or feeding it through a bucketing or whatever. But uh, I don't know how often it happens, like, yeah, I had like uh, 500 pounds of whatever in the last nursery diet left in. And it's me going to go in that first bulk delivered diet to my next nursery group that's going through there. Is that a super common thing? I imagine it must be, but how much does that screw things up? I, I think it happens probably more than what some people think it does, uh, but it's it's a huge no-no, uh, and a lot of guys like to do it just simply to get both their tandem bins back, which is huge. It's it's a big deal for feed management, you know. Said if you have feed left over from the previous turn, it's sitting in that other bin where you could have called and had your other diet. It gives you a little more flexibility, uh, especially with your feed orders. But now all of a sudden, I'm running that other older pig diet through. Mm -hmm. I, I would say you crash and burn more pigs by doing that than anything else from a nutrition platform. It's just not designed for those little pigs. Yeah. We've trialed it a couple times, especially with these 24 day old pigs. A lot of conversations I'll have is some producers just fly out, skip that first diet. And they're like, well, I have all these fallouts and they're 24 day old pigs. Well, that yeah. first diet is the transition from mom to corn soy. Yeah. The instant you pull that, skip it, or run older diet feed in, you're going to start to crash and burn a lot of pigs. It, it just, you can't do it. And it's it's tough to wrap our heads around, even as a nutritionist, uh, seeing these older lean pigs, we've tried it. And it, yeah. it just doesn't work. And you got to be very careful. And I think it's tough for a lot of guys to just hold off on pulling the trigger and opening that slide gate and running it through so they can get that feed bin empty. And it's, it's interesting, a common observation is on maybe they got a really good diet, or at least perceived good diet coming in. It's like, yeah, they're loose. And, and then maybe maybe because of the nutritional profile, it's not, there's maybe something that's causing the looseness, but it's a maybe a, an appropriate, otherwise uh, formulated diet for nursery one. And they say, you know, they don't scour as soon as they put them on to the, the first grind mix after the pellet or, or the next diet. And so then they want to advance that quicker and it's cheaper. That's mm -hmm. in the back of their mind. And maybe it is true that they don't scour, but it's not an appropriate diet for that young pig. I see that constant split of like, yeah, they, as soon as they put them on the next diet, they seem to dry up a little bit. So it must mm -hmm. be better for them. Well, it may dry them up and they may have less looseness associated with that, but there may be more follow up because it's just, you're advancing them way too quickly or you jump right through that diet. Mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm bouncing around something I think you just said, which is don't skimp on that first diet because there's stuff in there that would prevent fallout. Mm -hmm. And really the goal is the fallout. You, you've got to reduce that so you can get as many or as uh, close to 100% of those pigs out of the nursery mm -hmm. at, as uh, something, something looked like a cookie cutter that can perform the finisher versus, yeah, 5% rooster work. They were way lighter. They were like 10 pounds lighter than the rest of the feeder pigs going out or, or less than that. Yeah. Uh, is that fair? Is that, that correctly? That's fair. And I, I think it even goes back to a little bit tying it into your, you know, we kind of touched on it with the bean meal making your diets cheaper. But it also goes into kind of what we're talking about is that first diet is more expensive. Sometimes the second and third are more expensive than that first peer grind and mix. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of guys, they see those expensive nursery diets and they'll balk at it. But in today's age, in a thousand head group, if I have a 50 cent more expensive nursery diet or to feed that phase one, it's 50 more cents a pig. Right. Holy smokes, to get that pig to market, that's just two more full value pigs. Yeah. Or if you're buying lean pigs for $100 a pop, if I can save five of those little buggers in a thousand head group, I paid for that nursery feed. And I think uh, Spencer, in your experience, it's pretty easy to pay for a little more expensive nursery feed. Wouldn't you say, I mean, even if you're not looking at Pipestone's platform, but other platforms that generally tend to have better nursery diets, mm -hmm. it's it, you see the response and you well, see it fast. And it would change over time depending on whatever economics are going on. Right now, just for future, future listeners to frame up now, what is the 23rd of 23rd. February, February of 2022. Uh, wean pigs, it's easily mid-90s for a good wean pig uh, is, is what the market would bear right now for wean pig sales. So super valuable pigs, and maybe in the future when they're five bucks, we'll be saying, man, a hundred bucks really? But yeah, hundred dollar wieners are coming out. So 50 cents a pig, half a percent of cost we're talking about. It's a, it's not even a, it's a half a percent of your cost. 
the difference that I said make, what is the effective difference that that 50 cents a pig could make for a percent fall? I'm like, I had, I had 1% fall back versus five. I mean, what, what kind of differences would you see with an inappropriate versus an appropriate nursery? That you're guessing. I mean, just from a fallout, right? Uh, it can be huge. I think the biggest shift is anywhere between, in certain instances, I've seen up to two to three or 4% more full value pigs just because you're having a better nutrition platform going that would categorize as mortality or fallout pigs yeah so it, it, it can be huge if, if especially if you're going against a diet that oh we're it's really yeah. cheap but it's high in bean meal and you're burning out a lot of pigs within the first 10 days of life because yeah. their, their stomachs can't handle it or their their guts just can't handle it and to frame that up if we pigs are ballpark hundred dollars mm -hmm. and it's three it's four let's say four percent let's just max it out four percent between mortality fallout. and fallouts yeah we'll throw it together three, that's four percent full value versus not their yep. uh that's it's easy math because then it's four percent of 100 that's four dollars a pig is your impact for 50 cents a pig diet cost mm -hmm. you know that would be easily and that you know even without the high value pig uh the, just the, the value as a finishing pig later and not being sold as a cold light versus uh being a full value which is a Second impact, besides just going out of the nursery, it's mm -hmm. like how many did I have actually go to the finisher and make it out with the rest of the group? Is that an amplifier or is that just continue on from the same? I think it's an amplifier. I mean, what do you, when you go into a client and you preach to them about just management in general, when do you tell them it's the most intensive, when you should be there a lot in the day? It's the first three weeks. That's when most nursery programs are, first three weeks. If I don't get the first three weeks of pig, that pig's life dialed into a T, Boy, it makes your finishing life a lot rougher. Yeah. And I, I think uh, a lot of guys realize that. That's why they're there two, three, four times a day when they get pigs in the first 10 days of their life mm -hmm. compared to late in life when if I started them right and I did the right management steps early on, I can chore a barn in 30 minutes. It's pretty quick because my pigs are looking awesome. Yeah. Whereas if I skimped early on nutrition, I skimped early on management, the guy that's trying his barn or should be trying his barn an hour and a half every day, late finishing, probably doesn't realize he could have saved that time early. Oh on. yeah, it's a it's an easy trade off, and it's funny when you work with producers, the guys that realize that, they realize it, they know it's true, and they know they know it's true, and they know a lot of other guys don't, and it's like this almost like a Masonic temple secret or something. I just do this and this and this, and, <laughs> and they don't have they don't have to worry. They know the impact is there, mm -hmm. but you run into so many guys, you're like, oh, I got other stuff to do, and. And so then they just skimp on the nursery care in the first week of just getting them started, first yeah. couple of weeks. Okay, so you, you've talked about economics here quite a bit, and uh, things that I would say I hear when I'm out in the field is people look at uh, my feed cost is cost per pound of gain, cost per pound of gain, it's this many cents, mm -hmm. and they really focus on that. Talking to you just over the last year or so, it's like, oh, you know, margin over feed cost, huge. Okay, well, why would you look at that? And I guess I frame it up as I got a I got a nursery and I'm feeding two different diets and I'm watching these mash set of pigs. Like they're from mm -hmm. the same side and I'm feeding one program versus the other. And I'm gonna compare on margin over feed cost. Describe, why would you look at margin over feed cost uh, as a better point of comparison rather than my feed cost per pound of gain? So I I think it's feed cost, feed cost per pound of gain is a great measurement to look at. It's a simple platform. It's relatively easy to capture everything. Why do I prefer margin over feed cost? It's true look at your revenue per pig after your feed cost has been accounted for. And at the end of the day, if I have more money left in that bucket, the revenue bucket to pay my other expenses, I'm gonna be a lot more profitable. And so, uh, you know, walking you through the math this morning and why it's a little different, right? I, I, when I do, I'm just gonna have the total pounds gain divided by my feed cost. That's feed cost per pound gain. Again, super simple calculation where margin over feed cost, I gotta look at, how much did my pig gain at the current market setting? Because there should be different design, uh, diets designed for different market settings, right? Mm -hmm. Going into the summer months, we're revving those pigs up and we're pushing them through the gates as fast as we can on the diet side. Fall diets, we're gonna reel them back. They're gonna eat really well. There's not that heat stress factor. So that's why margin over feed costs is a lot more accurate because it looks, it accounts for those diet changes. It accounts for, yeah, I paid a little more in the nursery, but my pigs perform better late. And it kind of levels that playing field because I take in actual revenue generated when that pig marketed minus my total feed cost it took to feed that pig. And then boom, there's the margin over feed cost. 
And at that point, it gets relatively simple to even add your fixed costs into that side. So it's margin over fee and fixed costs. So now I'm really dialing in how much I actually make yeah. on that pig. Yeah, two things hit me. One is you gotta have good records for more for the margin over feed cost because you got more input, more stuff, more complex stuff going in. But if you got good data, if you got good records coming in, I'd say more and more and more every year producers do have that. It's an it's an achievable calculation versus just my feed feed dollars that were delivered versus how many pounds they sold. Mm -hmm. it's, it's easier, but it's not as good. Second thing would be the fallout and or oh they didn't gain very fast and I missed my market weight target by mm -hmm. a huge amount and I didn't make very much but my feed cost per pound gain was relatively cheap. Well, yeah, you didn't achieve your goal of getting them the speed yep. you needed during the summer months. It, or was, whatever. it was cheap to get them to 260, but I lost a lot of money by not getting them to 280. Right. So and it helps wash that noise out. And the, the kind of the aha moment for me in talking about it was I'm comparing one way to feed the pigs on a company program plan versus another on the same theoretical pig. Maybe even do a side by side trial with the same pigs in, in your nursery you're finishing or, or two groups right next to each other. It's a good way to look at things point in time, like my reality today with this plan versus this plan, it's, it's probably the most valid way to do that. So if you're trying to, if you're a producer, you're trying to prove it to yourself, mm -hmm. do it that way with that analysis, just to make sure you account for the follow-up, the slower gain, faster gain, whatever, so that you're not narrow tunnel visioning yourself on feed cost per pound gain. That's fair to say? That's really fair to say. Okay. All right. I'm just realizing I've had four cups of coffee and you and I talk fast anyway. Anybody listening to this podcast probably has to change their settings and like turn it down to 0.75 speed or something. Like yeah, that. I would say I usually listen to podcasts at 2x. <laughs> uh, you're not going to be able to do it on this one. So yeah. All right. Well, uh, I think we hit it. Anything else you wanted to cover on there, Hayden? I mean, you, you're passionate about this. You've got some thoughts. You know, uh, the other thing, if we're going back to the basics, we did touch on it, but feed budget management, one last thing, right? I think it's super overlooked, but especially guys that they order more of a phase or less of a phase, uh, you can get yourself in a rabbit hole really fast by ordering more of one of your earlier phases. Now all of a sudden I'm spending a lot more money on a pig that didn't need to be there. And when I start cutting and skimping, you have fallouts in the nursery or even later on in finishing, you can get that flank biting, tail biting, or just terrible performance. Yeah. So it's one last thing that I wanted to throw out there if we're getting back to the basics, but it's an easy thing that's overlooked. Could your nutritionist will, will stage out, this pig needs this many pounds of this, and you, you want, or he or she will craft that plan, that schedule. Um, how often is that stuck to by the producer? Pretty good. I mean, pretty well. Is that something like? Yeah, most of the time they they do overfeed or underfeed something, mm -hmm. or is it not? It's it's actually pretty reliable. I don't know. You tell me. I, I think it's done pretty good, but at the same time, there's there's always that one odd case where it's not, and I think it's just an overlooked thing that any nutritionist can make you the best program in the world, but if you don't follow the feed budget, sometimes it's uh, also a downfall. Are there times when you want to stray where it's like, man, these pigs don't look good. I think I should stretch my my N one diet longer is it like an audible you're calling out during the middle of the game in certain instances you, you might want to do that it, but yeah it's always game by game right hey soft farms weaning up uh because there's going to be a blizzard tomorrow things are going to be coming in at 18 days okay can we get an extra half a pound of that phase one in there okay then we'll do audibles like that you yep. know okay yep all right uh real good I'm trying to think of something we could talk endlessly on this but i think mm -hmm. we covered some good basic stuff I hope our listeners uh, got something out of this, um, and I also hope you have a welcoming a new new member of your family in a successful way here in whatever month or, or how long is it going to be? It's going to be about a month. a month. So, but yeah. So good luck on that, Aiden. Um, so thank you for being here. Yeah. Well, thank you for having me, and uh, we can we can cut this off pretty fast. Spencer's eyes, you can't see it; they're turning pretty yellow. Uh, going back to the comment of too much coffee. Oh, seriously. So all right. <laughs> Um, yeah, so thanks to our listeners. Uh, join us next time for the next Swine Time podcast. Uh, thanks, Dave, for being here. Appreciate hey, thanks, Spence. Swine Time podcast was created for the pork industry and individual pork producers around the country. Hosted by Dr. Spencer Wayne with the Pipestone Veterinary Services, the podcast contains pork industry news, advancements in animal care, and how to enhance your productivity. Monthly podcasts are available on Spotify, Google Music, iTunes, Anchor, 
and on www.pipestone.com.